it's sad that those historical antagonisms are, are still influencing uh, behaviors, current behaviors. Um, and I think if that can be, um, you know, set aside, and, the, and as you say, the, the real enemy is seen categorically as the ANC, then, then hopefully that um, those set of antagonisms can be um, can be set aside for good. How can we get South Africa's economy growing again? Well, somebody who has a few ideas is Toby Chance. He is an entrepreneur and business consultant and a one-time member of parliament in South Africa. Toby Chance, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, David. So Toby, you have quite a unique background, both in terms of business as well as politics. Could you uh, give us a brief sketch of your biography? Okay. Um, thank you, David. Yes, I, I guess I'm... Um, relatively rare in the sense of having both been uh, in active politics as a member of parliament and also having been in business. And I'm not just talking about corporate, the corporate sector, but also having been involved in, in small business development um, and uh, running and, and owning small businesses um, in South Africa. But my, um, my interest in politics really was um, when I was at university in the UK and um, I was part of an organization called the Tory Reform Group, which was a, a sort of one nation conservative pressure group. And one of my VAC jobs um, was working at the House of Commons in the uh, Select Committee for Energy. Um, I was a research assistant, and this was back in 1981. And uh, the, the topic that we were looking at was, was the question of nuclear energy versus renewables. <laughs> and it seems that 40 years later, not much has changed. Um, and so when I came to South Africa, um, my first, the first business that I set up was actually selling and installing solar water heating systems, uh, believe it or not. Um, and so I didn't I've had realize very, they very, had renewable energy back in those days. Well, they did. They did. We, we imported them from Israel, um, which was one of the pioneers in solar, solar heating. Um, and um, so since then, I've always had an interest in, in energy and in politics. And I, I went into parliament uh, quite a lot along time later than that, but um, but still retain obviously an interest, although I'm not in parliament anymore, um, in the political arena and obviously in business. And how is it that you came to South Africa, Toby? Well, my uh, relations, my uncle came out here in the 40s, and um, I came to South Africa on a holiday after graduating and found the country fascinating and um, decided that I wanted to tra travel through Africa to see a bit more of the continent. So I did that in 1984 on a truck. And then um, when I arrived, uh, it was just a fascinating time to be in South Africa in 1984. Uh, the tricameral parliament had just um, been in operation for a year or so. And uh, the country seemed to be on the verge of some in important breakthroughs, which of course it was. And I, I was living in Durban at the time and was able to uh, go to the, um, the Rubicon speech in the Durban City Hall. Well, when, as we all know, P.W. Boerter disappointed the world um, with his uh, failed uh, initiative to, um, you know, to start the reform process. Um, so, uh, yeah, having, having come to the country, I've never really had a good enough reason to leave. Right. Well, I was born in 1983. So by the time you arrived, I was uh, only just starting to, to realize what was going on. I didn't have any sense of the uh, reforms of P.W. Boerter and, and how those would end up. but. Uh, what about the economy here in South Africa? Let's look more at the present time that we're living in. And, you know, we're seeing very low levels of growth, high unemployment's now north of 34%, and that's only on the official definition. So what, in your view, is causing South Africa's economy to slow down, become less competitive? Um, David, I think that the, the obvious place to start is the energy uh, constraint. And, and that's been with us for well, since 2008, as we're well aware. And although um, in the last few days it's become worse, um, it's become a massive constraint on growth because we simply can't uh, invest in new productive capacity without a, a reliable source of electricity. So it's absolutely essential that the government puts um, every available brain power to solve this problem. And there are lots of solutions out there. It just requires the political will to uh, remove the blockages, remove the um, regulatory uh, obstacles to making this possible. But I think um, on a more fundamental level, 
um, the problem that we have in this country is that the governing alliance um, is really stuck in the 1970s. Its mentality is stuck in a statist view of how to run an economy. And that results in um, organizations that ordinarily would be focused on, on growth and development, just not really having the motivation to do so. Um, and, you know, we only recently heard Nkosazam at Laimini Zuma saying that uh, the state should be playing an even bigger role in the um, in the economy as as uh, she believes it does in China, although in fact the reverse is the case, certainly since Deng Xiaoping became the president uh, a generation ago. So uh, that's a, f a fundamental problem, and that means that we have um, inefficient state-owned enterprises, we have uh, government crowding out investment, uh, the private sector investment strike is, is, a, is, a, is a clear uh, indicator of this. And so we simply don't have the business confidence that is necessary to, to invest um, in infrastructure, in uh, new productive capacity, skills development. Um, so those, those are the main factors. I, I think the other, the other problem is that we have a real um, demand problem in this country. We, we, we have a, a very low level of domestic consumption, uh, partly due to the fact that half of our workforce, potential workforce is unemployed. So we don't have the income and the tax revenue that would come from that. And instead of focusing on, on domestic demand, um, South Africa should be spending much more time um, developing export markets. And I think that South Africa's um, absence from global supply chains is a, is a real constraint on growth. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, the successful economies in the last 20 or 30 years that have been able to pummel poverty and, and develop, um, uh, develop their population and grow the economy four, five, six percent a year, almost invariably they have been um, tuned into global supply chains in a way which South Africa simply hasn't achieved. We rely too much for our, our revenue and exports on, on uh, primary goods. And the only industry that's really uh, tuned into global supply chains uh, is the motor industry. Um, although, in the sense, that is even not the case because we are, we're supplying end product to the export market, i.e. I cars, not components. Uh, unlike, for example, um, you know, Taiwan or Korea, who are producing many of the, the basic raw materials for and I, I, I'd say components for global supply chains. All right. Well, Toby, we had Sean Hagedorn on the show as well, saying that, again, that point, that South Africa needs to be much more export driven. Um, but now I can imagine with these energy shortages, even the motor industry uh, is, is going to be affected there. Um, you know, a lot of the tier one and tier two component manufacturers for the automotive industry you know, a lot of those are in KZN. Many of those were hit very badly by the riots last year. Some were taken out entirely. Um, so, you know, in terms of the broader business environment, you know, what other what other challenges are there here? I mean, the safety and security one, I would imagine, is is is, is a concern, particularly for overseas investors. Uh, what other factors do you think are, are playing a role here? Yeah, I think that that's quite right. Um, the uh, the threat of um, crime. Um, both at a local level um, and you know, nationally, as well as obviously the fact that um, institutions are collapsing under the weight of incompetence and corruption uh, are also constraints on investment. Um, and the fact that uh, we have a, a situation where the, um, the chief uh, business representative organization, Booster, is, is uh, warning the president and warning the country of further bouts of insurrection like we had last July. Uh, it just as indicative of the, the sense of um, uh, you know, worry and concern that exists in, in the business community. And this obviously um, is felt in international circles as well. Companies that want to come and, and invest in this country, I'm sure, are, are put off by the fact that we still have this um, uncertainty. Um, and then if, you, if we add to that the fact that we, we have a, um, a workforce which unfortunately is poorly educated, we have a, a very small number of uh, well-educated people in this country who are obviously um, globally competitive, but a large number of the school leavers that come into the workforce uh, have very poor literacy and numeracy, numeracy skills. Their STEM skills are very poor. 
And that results in not being able to compete um, in, in a global economy, which further limits our, our capacity to export. Right. Well, Toby, you mentioned the voice of organized business there, Busi Mavuso. She's been quite a, a prominent critic of late. She sits on the ESCOM board, uh, and she was saying uh, in a recent Scopa parliamentary meeting that ESCOM shouldn't be carrying the blame for the ANC's misgovernance failures and the way it's mishandled the ESCOM situation over many, many years. Um, but do you think that organized business has been forceful enough in putting forward an alternative policy agenda and criticizing hostile policies that create this inhibiting business environment that we're seeing? Um, I would say yes and no. I, I think that the um, the problem with business is that it needs to take its political blinkers off, if I can put it that way. What I mean by that is that business in this country is very reluctant to enter the political terrain. And, uh, and there's a good reason for that. And that is that every time they've done it in the past, they have been castigated. Going back to the days of T Tony Treya, you know, over 20 years ago, when he said that South Africa, you know, has political risk attached to it when he was uh, releasing the annual report of Anglo-American. And Tabo and Becky, you know, ripped it to shreds. So there's been a, a general reluctance on the part of business to engage uh, critically with government. That's not to say that they haven't put forward policies. They do regularly. In fact, um, uh, when after COVID, they put a very, very comprehensive um, economic policy document together under BS4, uh, or B, uh, sorry, B for South Africa, Business for South Africa, which is a newly um, formed organization com combining BLSA with, with the Black Business Council. And, and yet the government has, has ignored it largely. So, um, you know, when I first went into Parliament in 2014, in, in the very first committee meeting, I was the Shadow Minister for Small Business Development. Um, I raised the issue with the, with the minister, uh, Lindy Wizulu at the time, of, of the, the trust deficit. And she, she wasn't even aware that there was such a thing. You know, she was so divorced from the, from the business environment that she, she just denied that there was such a thing as a trust deficit. So there was a huge gap. Uh, between between business and government, which is supposed to have been closed in institutions like Ned, NEDLAC. Um, but unfortunately, it just hasn't been the case. So a business needs to try harder. I know that people like Neil Froneman um, from Sylvania Stillwater has made an attempt. He may be a little bit aggressive on, on occasions. But uh, business needs to be more forceful in, in explaining um, you know, the critical problems that we face, which are not just economic, they, they are political. Um, and yet, as I said, uh, most business people are either um, reluctant or incapable of entering the political train, terrain on any, um, on, any, on any level of sophistication. Yeah, I mean, I posed a similar question to Songhez or Zibi in a recent episode of this podcast. And he said, well, listen, you know, government is only really going to respond if they feel some kind of political pressure to do so if they, they feel that there's something to be lost by not engaging. And, you know, perhaps what I would suggest is that business needs to understand that it has institutional power and that that can be exercised for leverage. Um, and that doesn't mean that you must be a needlessly aggressive. It must just yeah. be about ha having a firm stance and saying, well, you know, these are our interests. These are the constituents that we represent, consumers, our employees. Uh, our shareholders, and this is what we want. This policy should not be accepted. I'm thinking EWC, well, I, NHI, I, I, etc. I would go further. Yeah, I would go further than that, uh, David. And I would say that um, business is very reluctant to um, get off the fence in terms of party political affiliation. And if you see, if you think of other mature democracies, you know whether it be America, Britain, Germany, France, you'll see that business essentially is very outspoken in terms of the political uh, positioning that they take. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case in this country. That there's been a stitch up between big business and, and the ANC. And, and, the, and big business has been very reluctant to, um, to be critical of the ANC and say, look, we need uh, new political formations or stronger opposition that can not just become opposition or remain as opposition, but can compete as potential governing parties, which means being prepared to say, I support this party or, or that party, but not the ANC. Yeah, I'd imagine that many of these businesses have lucrative contracts with the state, 
or they benefit from regulatory protection, or they have deployed cadres on their boards uh, who try to influence the, the agenda and yeah. decision-making in favor of well, the of government. Course. And, and that has been one of the winning strategies of the ANC since it became um, the government in 1994, is that through cadre deployment, they have infiltrated every walk of life, and that includes business. And uh, one of the things that business uh, did in the, in the 1990s for settlement was um, to ingratiate itself with the ANC through the adoption of what became BEE policy um, and the, you know, the transfer of ownership portions of their companies to um, well-connected uh, well connected ANC cadres. Yeah, and of course, this policy is dressed up in the language of transformation, empowering Black people. But actually, as we opened this conversation, many millions of Black people are on the margins of the economy. It's only a very small, politically connected elite that really benefits. Um, and any criticism of that is dismissed as racist or, or anti-transformation. Yes, I think one of the um, reasons for this is that if you go back to the 1994 settlement, and th this is quite well described um, by Sabisi Jonas in his book After Dawn, published a couple of years ago, he described the four main uh, groupings that negotiated that settlement, and they were, in his words, uh, the established uh, elite, uh, the new elite, uh, essentially the former being big businesses, the latter being the ANC. Then there, has, there was organized labor. And then there was the unemployed and the poor. And the one important class that um, was not part of this negotiated settlement was the entrepreneurial class, by which I mean the hundreds of thousands of small businesses that relied upon uh, a growing economy and um, competitive economy and deregulation to enable them to grow. And essentially that, that resulted in, in, in the economy missing out on huge potential that, that um, really has been with us ever since. Uh, and I think that the, um, the ability of government, labor and, and, and big business to you know, essentially to stitch up uh, the economy has been a major constraint on growth. And, and that is something which um, most commentators have failed to observe let alone fail to speak out on. Uh, I think it's beginning to change, but um, you know, when you have someone like Sipo Nkosi, who's the, the red tape czar that was appointed by President Ramaphosa, hardly even appearing at all. I mean, I don't, I, I don't think anybody's seen him, seen him in, uh, uh, you know, on the TV or in any media. Uh, you, know, you actually wonder, well, is the government serious about, about improving the lot of the small business uh, owner in this country? Yeah, I mean, I think an appointment like that is optics. Uh, he's obviously a very capable man, but he's operating within an institutional setting that is actively going to be working against him. Um, and, you know, you think of this idea of red tape, that it's just this uh, emergent thing that, that somehow is there and you just need to cut it and, and that will free up business. But no, it's the constraining policies are the consequence of the ideological convictions of the party. It's a exactly. feature, not a bug of the system. So. Uh, until you fix the underlying fundamentals of the policy framework, you're not really going to get rid of things like red tape. Yeah. And I, I think an added problem, uh, David, here is, is that we have to face up to the fact that because government departments in all three spheres of government and state-owned enterprises have now been run, if I can use that term, although they're not being run very well, by um, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, deployed cadres, um, it's going to take a long, long time to remove those people. So even if we wanted to suddenly remove the red tape and you know, improve the regulatory environment, it's going to take an awful long time because the people that have put it all in place are still there. So you know, we, we either have to change their approach and, and mindsets, which is going to be difficult, or we have to go through a process of extracting them. You see the problem happening in, 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 in for example, the city of Johannesburg or Schwani, where the turnaround time is, is, is you know, more than one term of government, more than five years, because you have to actually have the right people in place to make those changes. It took uh, the DA at least five years since they won Cape Town to actually achieve that. And, you know, only after one or two terms were they able to deliver the results. Yeah, I mean, in the same way that the policy of cadre deployment breeds red tape, it also breeds corruption. And, you know, there's been a lot of interest on the Zonda Commission over the last few years, and it's now finalized its reports. 
Um, but again, you know, I think uh, people look at corruption as this kind of aberration, but actually it's very much baked into the system. And uh, a feature of that, I think, is, is the preferential procurement policy, which is a key pillar of, of triple BE. And actually Zonda himself, yes. in one of the reports, uh, he mentioned that, and I'm quoting from him now, the primary national interest is best served when the government derives the maximum value for money in the procurement process. So again, we have right. this tension here between value for money and some kind of social outcome, i.e. race-based policies. Um, and you know, the solution is very clear, a point on merit, a point on cost, um, in terms of who you decide on who will be yeah. the, winning, the, the winner of a tender bid. Um, but you know, those are the uncomfortable bullets that we just need to bite in South Africa. You can't, you can't have both. But you see, in my view, that's not going to happen with the current government. Uh, because it's hardwired into their method of doing things. Uh, patronage, uh, preferential, not just procurement, but everything, uh, you know, preferencing a small group of, 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 of you know, increasingly wealthy and disconnected cadres. Uh, and, you know, the, the chances of that changing with, within the current regime are virtually nil, in my view. All right. Well, I think that sets us up for a discussion around political realignment, Toby. I mean, you've been involved in opposition politics for a large part of your career. And it seems like the ANC's hegemony is beginning to weaken and, and crumble. Um, it's not quite, uh, not quite dead yet, but seems to be dying. And uh, there's this interregnum, if you will. Um, and uh, you know, Antonio Gramsci, the, the Marxist political theorist, said that the old is dying, but the new cannot yet be born. I think that describes perfectly where we are at the moment in South Africa. So what do you think are the prospects for this grand political realignment and what would that look like? One of the problems with that in South Africa is our political system, um, which is dominated by uh, parties as opposed to individuals. And that is a big constraint uh, because whilst a, a, a parliament is sitting, um, it's very difficult to have the, the major players um, realigning themselves so as to be ready for an election when they might be able to form a new entity. Um, whereas that wouldn't be the case, for example, in, in a country um, where you had either um, uh, uh, a more um, fluid political system or whether you, where you had constituencies uh, where essentially an MP would be able to make his own mind up um, with the support, admittedly, of his constituency association. Um, so um, I, I think that there is a, 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 a real need for political realignment, and I think the public are, are calling for it. But wh whether it's going to happen in, in a smooth transition in this country is, I think, um, in question. Um, you know, the, the, the real issue, I think, is whether the opposition parties that are um, uh, grouping around a certain set of policies which could form an alternative government um, have the maturity to sit around the table and, to say, and decide that they are going to work together as opposed to sniping at each other. And also whether the, the ANC um, goes sufficiently below 50% in the next election to force um, a new alignment. In other words, they won't be able to, let's say, go into, into power with a, a couple of the, the minnows or maybe the EFF. So I think for a real political realignment, to happen. Um, you either have to have a split in the ANC, which I think is, you know, 50-50. I can't see that as being a necessarily outcome. Or we have to see the ANC going below 40%, at least, in the next election. So I think all um, efforts must be made in the next 24 months or less um, by uh, parties such as the DA, Action SA, uh, UDM, and others to um, realize that this is an existential uh, crisis uh, facing the country and that they have a massive responsibility to sit around and knock their heads together and, uh, and, and realign in a way which takes the country in a different direction. Right, Toby, well, I think that I absolutely agree with you, but whenever I open Twitter on my phone, I see some spat uh, breaking up between uh, the DA and Action SA and I'm sure it's very important to them that they score points against one another, but I wonder what the electorate thinks uh, of this uh, fighting. Yes. Uh, 
on that question, I would say that um, Action SA is more the guilty party in terms of initiating the spats uh, than, than the DA. I think the DA has been quite scrupulous uh, in the last nine to 12 months um, in, in trying to avoid um, making a extempore and, and ad hominem attacks uh, on uh, Action SA because they realized that the, the future of the country actually relies upon um, a modus operandi uh, being developed between those two parties. So I just hope that um, you know, maturity and, um, and sanity prevails in the end. Yeah, and I think there are a few areas of policy difference, but in many ways, the parties are quite similar. And I think it reminds me of what Sigmund Freud used to say, the narcissism of small difference, um, that essentially they're kind of competing in a way for the same turf as being uh, the standard bearer of the opposition. Meanwhile, the real opponent really should be the ANC and all of its destructive policies. Um, but, you know, I think your earlier example of the city of Cape Town, this kind of motley crew of of coalition partners, that actually enabled the city under Helen Ziller's leadership to say, okay, well, well, here is an alternative way of doing things. Once the electorate could see that in action, they then ended up going with uh, the DA uh, more, uh, you know, uh, more wholly and, and more thoroughly. So, I mean, do you think that that's, that's a potential outcome that we could see here? I mean, Joburg and Twane seem to be managing. Uh, there's a lot of service delivery issues, but uh, you know, they seem yes. to be holding uh, it together. I think back to 2006, um, the, the coalition in Cape Town uh, comprised six or seven parties. And, um, and after a while, uh, the ID uh, merged with um, the DA to give the DA effectively a majority. I think that the likelihood in Joburg of that happening is, is, is less because you have more parties competing uh, that have a greater share of the vote. So um, I think whilst the DA is, is obviously aiming to become the majority party in Gauteng, uh, I think um, it's got to face up to the fact that that is an unlikely prospect and that they have to be prepared to sit around the table with other parties to achieve um, a majority which is why those relationships have to be um, cultivated very, very closely. And, and I really hope that the personal antagonisms that exist between certain leaders uh, can be set aside and in, in, you know, in, in place of that, a more collaborative approach is developed. Yeah, I think one of the problems that many of the Action SA staffers are former DA members themselves. And so whereas they might have in the past formed part of an internal faction within the DA kind of warring for influence, now that that faction has kind of almost been externalized and now these conflicts are in full view in the public domain, there's, there's no kind of yeah, pressure release it's, valve. It's sad that those historical antagonisms are, are still influencing uh, behaviors, current behaviors. Um, and I think if that can be um, you know, set aside and, the, and as you say, the, the real enemy is seen categorically as the ANC, then, then hopefully that um, those set of antagonisms can be um, can be set aside for good. All right, well, Toby, I was watching a presentation by John Steenhuisen at Chatham House recently, and he said that there almost are two parallel tracks. So the one is the decline of the ANC, which we've talked about, and the other is the breakdown in the capacity of the state. So he said that we're in a race against time here as the, the state really starts to fall into dysfunction and disorder. Um, what do you recommend businesses do to try and mitigate against this state failure. Um, what, what does, you know, we've got a couple of years to go into the elections. There's no guarantee of any outcome there. What can businesses start to do to protect themselves against, uh, you know, some of these, these, these deep structural problems that we've been discussing? Um, it's a good question. And I think obviously every business has to look at its, uh, at its core function um, and its, its revenue sources and its competitive its sources of competitiveness and, and drill down on what those things are and how they can be uh, enhanced and accentuated. You know, clearly uh, in tough times, uh, any nice to have need to be discarded, costs need to be contained, but also um, any business that is going through tough times in a market that is uh, um, challenging, um, the ones that are more aggressive in their marketing and, 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 and their sales and their pursuit of new markets tend to be the ones that come out on top. 
Um, although it's it's scary to do so, you know, when when the market and the, and the economy is is is, is tough. Uh, companies that uh, spend more on on aggressive marketing and uh, building the top line tend to have a more successful bottom line. So I would say that um, one of the aspects of that, as I said earlier, is is chasing markets that are are more um, prosperous. So any company that has a product or service that um, has a global market should be out there um, selling into those global markets. And now that we have uh, effectively a, a digitized economy, um, it, it's not so difficult to uncover those markets as it was 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, we're having this conversation on Zoom, um, you know, the opportunity for business executives and, and sales teams to go out and and ferret out business opportunities internationally, particularly in, in, in countries that have high disposable incomes, should be top priority. You know, we have a very, uh, we have a dismal economy in this country, as I said earlier, where we have 40% um, unemployed. That means that they don't have an income. So we might have a population of 60 million, but we probably only have 10 or 15 million consumers of, which could be classed as middle class. Um, so it's a very small market. So South Africans have to go out and look for, for markets that have higher disposable incomes. Uh, and that tends to be in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah, and I also think collaborating with like-minded individuals or firms, I think is a good way of doing that. Uh, I had quite an interesting discussion with Pete LaRue and Russell Lamberti of Sarkalika. They're providing that institutional platform for businesses to collaborate. They're not just operating in yeah. isolation. No, no, I, I absolutely agree. And I think um, part of what, uh, what the business um, community in this country has to understand is that collaboration should be uh, across value chains. Um, in other words, big businesses that have resources and capacity and, and capital need to see that innovation often happens outside of their organizations and they need to be looking for small businesses that are able to improve their competitiveness and then enable them to grow uh, collaboratively globally. Um, so that's, I think, a, a great source of, um, of opportunity. And it, it, it requires a determined effort to do it. You know, it's not going to happen just, um, you know, you wake up in the morning and it happens. It has to be determined. Yeah, and I think also there are opportunities in state failure, right? Like, I think if you're in uh, the energy generator business, um, selling diesel generators, you're doing quite well for yourself right now. So I think identifying an area in which the state used to provide a service where you as a private organization can provide that, I think, could be a good way of, of developing new markets domestically, notwithstanding um, some of the constraints that we've spoken about earlier. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and I think that um, companies that are... Um, Looking at um, new markets should also realize that they have um, they have a huge wealth of of talent globally that they can tap into. Um, I mean, although of course unemployment is a problem in this country, uh, there is a global workforce. Um, you know, digital nomads, to use the terminology, people who are prepared to work anywhere um, can be tapped into um, to, to to acquire certain skills that are maybe absent, um, but um, that's another thing which, which South Africa needs to be um, turning its attention to, and the government needs to be much more open-minded about attracting skills. You know, we have certainly a skills deficit in this country, and we have fantastic, um, believe it or not, um, environments in which people can can live. I mean, there's certain, it, you know, we have fantastic climate, we have good services in, in many parts of the country. Um, wonderful food, in other words, an environment in which people would actually quite enjoy living in. We have to be prepared to attract people from around the world that are also feeling a bit insecure. I mean, it's not just South Africa that is going through problems. Many countries in the world are, are experiencing difficulties. And, and I think a lot of mobile um, people, people that are, that are medium to high net worth, have a choice as to where they're gonna live. And I think South Africa needs to be much more assertive and aggressive uh, in attracting those sorts of people to come and live here. Yeah, and your point that a lot of other countries are experiencing volatility. I mean, we're recording on the 11th of July. Um, I saw a news item recently that Turkey is experiencing inflation of 80%. Uh, you know, countries like Brazil also, uh, you know, going through uh, quite a tumultuous period. 
Chile is proposing all sorts of uh, socialist amendments to its constitution. Uh, so yeah, we're not alone in terms of volatility. All right, Toby, well, looking ahead to 2024 and beyond, what do you feel are the prospects for the future of South Africa? Are you uh, cautiously optimistic? Yes, I am. And I think like many people in this country who um, are looking at the future with a certain amount of disquiet, um, I am optimistic, uh, but under certain conditions. There has to be a change of government. Is that, I've got no doubt about that. And not just any government, but there has to be a change of government um, with the right principles, values, and policies in place to see a significant shift. Um, I think that confidence is, is something which is very fickle. And just as it can turn down very quickly, it can also turn up very quickly. And uh, if the new conditions that I've described were to uh, come about, then I think there would be a flood of uh, interest in this country, um, both from local people, people live, living here, and people who, who don't live here but want to invest here. Um, the you know, professor, I think his name is um, De Witt, um, was famously said 50 or 60 years ago, South Africa is a history of political disasters and economic windfalls. And if we can try and find uh, a, a means of um, achieving political renewal as well as economic windfall, then I think the, the, um, the stars will shine brightly on, on this country's future. Uh, and it, it would be it would be a foolish person to bet against this country um, because it's it's uh, been able to achieve so much in a relatively short space of time and its human capital is phenomenal. It just requires um, the right leadership uh, um, and the right combination of of uh, policies and I say approach to 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 entering into a, a, the global economy and I think things can turn around very quickly. Toby Chance, thank you very much for joining me on the Solutions Podcast. Thank you, David. Much enjoyed it. If you enjoyed this conversation and you're watching on YouTube, please do give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. Also leave your thoughts on this episode down in the comments section. If you're listening on your preferred podcast platform, please do subscribe there as well and share it with your friends or family. My name is David Ansara. This is the Solutions Podcast. Until next time, take care.